if you read the scholars of state, uh, uh, state formation, or such as Charles Tilly, for example, when you start a revolutionary process, revolutionary process, you should realize it within a reasonable time. Otherwise, revolutionary process becomes state collapsing mechanism. So when you start changing the regime in Syria, you should, you should fulfill it maybe maximum with a year. Otherwise, it turns to be a state collapsing mechanism, which, is, which we are observing in Syria. So because there was no military experience on the side of opposition in Syria, one, we have state collapse right now. It's a state collapse. There is no state in, in any sense. Maybe in some parts of Qums, in some parts of Damascus, yes. But in the rest, it's a state collapse. The second is, because of the lack of military experience from the opposition, there, there became a gap. The gap is now being fulfilled by radical groups. That is why we have radicals here. I mean, we have so many different radical groups. And after almost three years, right now, number one priority of these radical groups is not to challenge a set, but to consolidate their authority in the region. There is no doubt. For example, if you speak from Ishid, Daesh, I don't think, I mean, of course they don't like Assad, but when you, when you make some interviews with the members of those groups, you understand that they want to consolidate their position in the field, in the field. This is enormously important because, in my understanding, before the Arab Spring, radicalism was a matter of peripheral issue to the Western mainland. Peripheral issue means that it's about Afghanistan, it's about South Pakistan, Waziristan, so and so forth. Radicalism was operationally influential in, in those areas close to Turkey. By operational influence, I mean they were organizing some terrorist attacks in London, in Istanbul. But because of Syrian problem, radicalism is now approaching to the mainland. And if Syrian problem continues another three years, most probably it, it will start creating some sociological interaction with the, with, the, with the society over there. In, in, in 2008 or 2009, uh, I, I had the opportunity of spending some time in Afghanistan, part of a NATO project, and I discovered people are happy about Taliban because it's a kind of rule. I mean, compared with nothing, Taliban could become persuasively better for Afghani people, Afghani women, because at least there's a kind of rule. You don't like that, but it's a rule compared with complete or perfect anarchy. So if Syrian problem continues in this way, radicalism become a rule or non-producing sociological reality close to the European mainland, in that sense, if I, I use this 19th century German geopolitical concept. This is a, this is a point. This, this is important from Turkish perspective, because Turkey's Syrian border is 910 kilometers. It's collapsing, because it is enormously expensive to protect such a border. You need manpower, technology, and uh, theoretically speaking, very practically, Turkey's weakest point of military power is air defense. That is why we have NATO rather, rather systems. That is, uh, I mean, virtually right now, Turkish border to Syria is protected by NATO, or let's say clearly American uh, Patriots, Patriot systems, because it's, it's very long, 910 kilometer. You cannot control that. I mean, you need maybe thousands of people to protect such a long and long border. Or to protect such a border, you need a kind of authority over across the border. Without, if there is no authority across the border, protecting border is very, very, very difficult. Uh, so this is, this, is the, you know, this is the main problem. That, that, uh, interestingly, this has very serious influence on the domestic politics because Turkish people, if you check the public surveys, <coughs> Almost all Turkish people believe that Assad is authoritarian, no doubt. But when you ask the Turkish people how the Turkish government has handled the issue, there is a growing criticism. There is a kind of criticism about this, this policy. Uh, so Syrian problem is becoming a major security problem. I should talk about a little bit on Syrians who are living here. Syria, uh, according to official numbers, the number of Syrians in Turkey reached one million right now. I think 
more than one million. For example, I, I live in in a city, the sixth biggest city of Turkey, Gaziantep, which is very close to Syrian border. The number of Syrian refugees in the city is 210,000 right now. And I visited some small villages where Syrian people, their number is more than the original dwellers in those cities. So why I'm telling these numbers? Because I think Syrian refugee problem is no longer a refugee problem. It's a mass movement of people. Most probably, many of them will not go back. And it is required for regional countries, including Turkey, to realize this situation. It, it, it would be naive to believe that all people are going to go back to Syria. This is Middle Eastern politics. It happened in the past. It may happen again. I think it's happening right now. So many people, so, so millions of people, I mean, maybe two million to Jordan, one million. And again, according to UN reports, Turkey spent almost three billion dollars to the Syrian refugees right now. That's a big problem. I read the UNESCO report. The logic of living in a camp. We are part of our social <coughs> culture. We are reproducing our culture. Part of Turkish family, I learned how to be a Turk. But if you move to a camp, now you are out of that cultural chain. So you are, you can, you you stop reproducing <coughs> Syrian culture. So you are becoming something else. You are no longer a Syrian. Imagine a person who was 10 years ago in 2003. He spent 15 years in Iraq. No idea of national unity. No idea of president. No idea of national football club. Now, who is this guy? There is no. So Iraqi system cannot produce homo nationalis, which means national man, citizenship. It's happening in Syria right now. Imagine a girl who left Syria when he was eight years old, four years ago, now 12 years old. She's no more Syrian. She's becoming a different person, which could be positive or negative. So I'm talking about millions of people who left Syria. And I don't think many of them are going to go back uh, because all the signals we are receiving from Syria, it's a very dramatic problem. When we compare Syria, with the similar, similar cases, political science will tell the same point. If multicultural societies experience a state collapse, the inevitable outcome is federalism. But when I say federalism, I don't mean successful federalism as we observe in some part of Europe or US. It's a kind of problematic federalism. So Syria is likely to be something between Lebanon or Iraq. But the problem is, when you analyze the demographic map of Syria, the different ethnic groups are not separated clearly like Iraq. Even it's not very clear in Iraq, but comparatively it's better. So most probably, uh, Syria is going to require something like Dayton Agreement if things go well. I mean, because it's very, very complex. If you, I mean, uh, I spent some time in Syria. Uh, there is no perfect ethnic or sectarian areas. They are intersecting to each other. There is a Christian community, Alawite community. <coughs> Maybe some part of there is a Kurdish community, but even over there, it's very difficult to create the segregated areas. So it's very difficult. Because it's a, it's a civil war right now. I mean, according to uh, some mainstream approaches, if state kills more than 100,000 people in a year, it's a civil war. It's a civil war in Syria. Uh, I don't want to talk about the problems about Syrian opposition. It's another very, very sad story. Uh, so this this brought a major problem to the, to the whole region and also Turkey, because Turkey received more than 1.5 billion Syrian refugees, spending so much money, and also it's creating a huge security problem. Another problem, before talking about Turkey-Iran, linked with Syria, is, of course, Kurdish problem. Turkey has a huge Kurdish problem, and Syrian issue has a potential to transform this problem. How? So far, you know, the, the, uh, so far, Turkey's Kurds, symbolized PKK, Abdullah Öcalan, has been regarded as terrorist or highly negative by international actors. But, it's the first time in northern Syria there is an emerging Kurdish order which is linked to PKK. And that group is recognized legally by the Syrian opposition. So 
This is critical for third because if any deal happens in Syria, it is likely that the Syrian order is going to recognize PYD, the Kurdish movement in Syria called PYD. So for the first time, Turkey is going to face a different reality, PKK, most probably become a legal part of another political system, Syrian political system. It's a big uh, issue. And <coughs> since the Iraqi problem, the Kurdish groups have always followed a very, let's say, clever agenda to the problem. For example, when we had the Saddam Hussein problem, and when we have right now Assad problem, the Kurds have two track agenda. One is challenging the regime. The second is consolidating their authority. It's been successful in Iraq and successful in Syria. Today, in many villages of northern Syria, Abiyat, Salakani, there is an emerging Kurdish political order. But there is a problem. The problem is to finance a state, you need financial support. Northern Syria is economically uh, lacking oil or gas or in an economic community. Compared with northern Iraq, for example, if you visit Arbil or in Kurdish Havlar, it's something like you feel it's becoming Dubai like construction. I mean, when I was there a couple of months ago, it's, you feel that there's uh, money, some people are pushing money to the city. It's becoming, you know, luxury buildings, you know, malls and so on and so forth. It's a, it's a function of money. State is a function of money. So financing statehood in northern Iraq is comparatively easy. The only problem is Mr. Barzan needs a legal corridor to push Iraqi oil, most probably Adana, Jehan, and Turkey. It depends on American, uh, you know, Proof, but approval, but in any case, they have potential uh, cash. But when it comes to northern Syria, most of Kurdish groups are living in small cities or somehow big villages. There is no Arabic, democratically speaking, and there is no economic uh, such a potential. So this is the negative uh, <coughs> limit. But on the other hand, sociologically, you feel it. There is an ongoing identity process emerging in northern Syria. Uh, this increased the leverage of PKK vis-a-vis -vis Turkish government because we have right now ongoing peace process with Kurds right now. Actually, it's a kind of ceasefire right now because uh, we have no idea about the details of the process. DDR. DDR means that uh, disarming and uh, other technical process of peace process. So far, there is no official explanation about the ongoing peace process, but there is a ceasefire. It's a long ceasefire. But Syrian problem is increasing the leverage or bargaining capacity of Kurdish groups is a Turkish government, because there is an ongoing emerging state Kurdish order in northern Syria. So Syrian problem, and, and, uh, when we analyze in this perspective, is creating a huge pressure on Turkey, domestically and internationally because of this border security, radicalism, uh, and refugee problem. And if, if Assad stays in Syria somehow, even in Damascus, it's going to be a big geopolitical problem. For example, I don't want to get in detail, but uh, despite we have problems with Israel, Turkey's uh, trucks and uh, exports are transmitted through Jordan, Haifa, Israel corridor, because there is no alternative. It's a very different geography. First of all, there are no, road, no roads. I-20, I think, the most geographically critical road that connects Damascus to Jebel Sahiliya is still uh, ruled by Assad Authority. So without Assad for Turkey, it's difficult to keep geographical continuity. So you need Israel or Jordan, which increase exports uh, at all prices. For example, before this crisis, uh, the, the money you should have paid to a uh, lorry truck driver is almost tripled right now. It's very expensive to find the truck because there's a security problem and border problem. Insurance are increasing right now, but Turkey desperately needs that markets over there. Uh, so the Syrian problem also economically very, very negative aspect for Turkey. So in that sense, uh, in my understanding, we shouldn't talk about long-term solution for Syria. We should focus on short-term. 
because it is becoming very mixed, very difficult question. Uh, and I'm sure you all aware why it is difficult to solve the problem because there is this still ongoing cold war order in that specific area. When in 1979 Islamic Revolution took place in Iran, it was first Soviet Russia that recognized Iran, then Syria. So their strong relationship go back, go back to uh, Cold War era, which is still alive. I mean, we are talking about post Cold War era, but post -cold, despite we are living in the post Cold War era, some Cold War practices are still applied or valid in some parts of the globe, including that part of the area. I mean, Hezbollah is there, Syria is there, Russia is over there. The number of Indian citizens in the Gulf is 6.5 million. India, for example, uh, publicly support Assad as a strong ally because they need uh, energy to, I mean, forget about energy, to, 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 to bring those people back requires a huge strategic planning, which is difficult to do. 6.5 million is a big number. And also, we have China. China is a very interesting player in the area. So, Given this international balance, it's difficult. But in this balance, I want to focus on one state which is peculiar, but important for Turkish movement. It's Iran, because uh, when we talk about Syria, the now, right now the key actor in, in, in Syria is Iran. If any solution we should talk about, it should happen through Iran. Iran is the de facto uh, rule maker in Syrian problem. Before the details, let me clarify my ideas about from Turkish perspective. Before Hassan Rouhani, we had Ahmed Nejad. I think Ahmed Nejad was an exception in Iranian uh, uh, politics. And he ignored the Iranian past since the revolution. He wasn't the guy to represent, uh, uh, let's say, the Iranian political culture since the revolution. And after Ahmed Nejad, we have Hassan Rouhani. Hassan Rouhani, who is known moderate, I don't think it's moderate in theory, because Rouhani served in all major security institutions in Iran. He's, he has a PhD. His PhD is on about very established Shia scholars who inspired Khomeini. But Rouhani is, has a difference. He has the legitimacy card of Iran, unlike Ahmed Nejad. If you speak with Rouhani, 